Let's talk with Professor Marcelo Flamarion. Um, good afternoon, Adriana. Can you hear Hi, me well? Good afternoon. Yes, I can hear you well. Okay, let me just uh, share my screen. Just a second. Um, Thank you. So in the meanwhile, I can introduce you. So okay. Professor uh, Marcelo Flamarion has completed his PhD in 2018 at the National Institute of Pure and Applied Mathematics, IMPA, in Brazil, with a period at the University of Bath in England. He had a postdoctoral position at IMPA as well, and currently he is a professor at Federal Rural University of Pernambuco. And today, today's talk is going to be Gravity capillary flows over obstacles for the fifty order force, Cartevex de Vries equation. So, thank you, Professor Marcelo. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I also would like to thank the organizers for the event and uh, more especially to this um, thematic section. So, uh, in this talk, we are going to discuss uh, graph capillary flows over obstacles. Uh, this is a work joint with uh, Professor Roberto Ribeiro Santos Jr. from Federal University of Paraná. He was the, the last speaker, actually. So, I'd like to start this talk uh, by defining some goals um, that we need to have in mind. So basically our idea is to understand a wave generated by the passage of a constant current of obstacles and somehow investigate how the amplitude of the obstacles control the, the dynamic of the generated waves, okay? So the problem that uh, I want you to have in mind is depicted in this video that I'm about to play. So we have an obstacle that uh, is located at x equals zero, and uh, we have some current that moves from right to left. And uh, as you can imagine, when the current passes over the obstacle, uh, waves will be generated in the free surface. And the idea is try to understand how the current speed and the amplitude of the obstacle affects the, the dynamic. Um, I started, uh, by asking once we already know what uh, we have in mind, what are the results available in the literature? So basically all the results that are available in the literature, in the literature uh, doesn't take surface tension into account. So the classification of the flow over an obstacle was done by Wu and uh, trapped waves uh, that's related to what the last speaker talked about. Uh, were done by Greenshaw in 19, uh, 1994. And some results on the FKDV equation were summarized back in 2004 by Milevsky. Okay. So uh, how I started studying uh, waves generated by current topography interaction. Uh, when uh, I was doing my PhD at IMPA, Professor Andre Nagin proposed me the work and then, and one of the articles that uh, uh, we did was this one that was published in 2019 uh, in the studies in applied mathematics. So in this article, we studied uh, the full Euler equations and uh, we tried to understand uh, how the amplitude of the obstacle affects the, the wave generation. So in the main results in this articles were, article was the classification of the flow over the obstacle, we showed that it depends only the current speed and the amplitude of the obstacle. And uh, we also showed that um, a very interesting feature, I guess Roberto mentioned uh, in, in the last section, that uh, when you have a topograph and you have a current, you have some pattern of waves that are produced. But uh, if you swap the, the topograph obstacle by a moving pressure on the free surface, what the same waves uh, are generated. So there are, uh, in particular, a region in the, the weakly nonlinear, weakly dispersive region, the pattern of the waves generated by a moving disturbance or a current uh, topography interaction is the same, okay? So uh, after working with the one obstacle problem, uh, about two years ago, we stumbled upon this article by Professor Greenshaw and Malmung 
it was published in the Journal of Fluid Mechanics back in 2016. And uh, in this work, what Greenshaw and Marion did was to consider the problem with two obstacles now. So the dynamic is quite different. Uh, what they did was to try to classify the flow into three stages. Basically, at the early stages, uh, we see the dynamic acting independently above each obstacle. There is no interaction, at least at uh, early times. Then when time goes on, there is some interactions between the two um, topograph obstacles. And the third stage is characterized by large times. So when we look at this picture and we see the last panel, for example, it is like uh, there was just one obstacle, the largest one. So in the sense, in this article, uh, Greenshaw said that um, the flow is characterized by the larger obstacle. And then uh, we start thinking about this problem. What would happen if we consider more um, hypothesis to the problem? If we consider, for example, uh, surface tension, if surface tension played an important role in the dynamic, uh, we ask ourselves if the, the dynamic would still be controlled by the large obstacle. So when we include surface tension, what are the governing equations? Uh, well, uh, let's start considering here some assumptions. We will assume that our flow is rotational. We have an incompressible fluid with constant density. And uh, under these assumptions, the velocity field can be written in terms of a potential velocity. So the, the velocity field in the bulk of the fluid is given by the gradient of phi. Uh, and uh, we assume that the average depth is scaled as h0. A typical wave amplitude is A, the typical wavelength is lambda, uh, the free surface is denoted by zeta. Uh, we have the two top localized topography obstacles modeled by the function uh, Y equals minus, minus one plus H of X and the constant current U. And the force that are acting in the fluid are the gravity and surface tension. So when we take all these uh, hypothesis into account. The equations that uh, describe the, the motion of the free surface are the Euler equations. And uh, we have four very important parameters here. Mu is the shallow water long wave parameter. Basically, it measures the ratio between the average depth and the wavelength. So when Mu is, is small, we are in the shallow water region. Epsilon measures the nonlinearity of the problem. So if the wave somehow has um, large amplitude, the nonlinearity is stronger. The through number, the same as Roberto mentioned in the previous talk, uh, is the ratio of the current speed and the long wave uh, shallow water uh, speed limit. So it's important to point out that when the through number is zero, for example, uh, we don't have a current acting um, in our book of fluid. And uh, B is the bond number. Basically, it controls which one, uh, which forces plays the more important role, if it's the surface tension or if it is the gravity. Okay. So we will assume, in order to obtain um, a symptomatic equation, we assume that mu is, is small and epsilon is, is small as well. So in that case, we'll be in the weakly nonlinear, weakly dispersed region. So when we introduce the new scales, uh, the new scale F, the through number, we um, demand it to be close to one. So we scale it as one plus epsilon F, where F is a constant. We also need to rescale the topography. It has to be quite small. It has to be order epsilon squared. Then one can obtain the classical uh, force at of degrees. It's the one is very similar to, to the one uh, used by Roberto in the, in the previous section. But here, the dispersed width term has this coefficient, uh, b minus a third over two. And uh, it's very interesting because when b equals a third, uh, this value we'll call critical, this dispersed width term vanishes and uh, we end up with uh, typical Burger's equation. And uh, well, since we are mathematicians, we want to understand what happens when b, b is close to a third. So 
in order to do that, we need to introduce a new scale. Um, one may ask why not to work with the burgers equation. It's just because we want nonlinearity and dispersion to be balanced. So we have solitary weight solutions, okay? So when B is close to a third or equals a third, we need to introduce a new scale in the variables X and T. Uh, the true number remains close to one as before. And the B uh, bound number is, is scaled as uh, a third plus uh, square root of epsilon um, uh, times B. So using this typical scale, the fifth order for the Kurtovac Davis equation was deduced by Milevsky and Van den Broek in this article published in 1998 in the wave motion. So they obtained this uh, fifth order FKDB equation and the two parameters now that are important for us once we fixed F to be close to one and B close to a third are this uh, small F and small B. So from now on, when I mention FKDV equation, uh, I will be having in mind this fifth order for the Kurtovac de Vries equation, okay? So uh, we will basically fix a B and uh, let F vary. But uh, before that, I want to discuss a little bit on the numerical methods that we will use to solve this equation, okay? Uh, we'll focus now on our numerical methods and um, simulations. So the numerical method to solve the force curve back degrees is very standard. Basically what we do is we apply the Fourier transform in both sides of the equations. And then it transforms the, the PDE into a family of ordinary differential equations uh, with uh, the parameter K. So this linear part of the equation can be solved um, exactly uh, using an integrating factor. And then we take the inverse um, Fourier transform to get back to the space XT. The evolution is computed through the classical Hunchkuta fourth order method, okay? So the method is very standard. Uh, issues regarding the numerical stability and uh, uh, accuracy of the method was uh, already studied before, so we can carry out our simulations without being worried about uh, numerical instabilities or dependence on the, the grid. So uh, to solve the, the equation, since it's an initial value problem, it's important to define uh, the initial state of our problem. So we have this free surface at rest, we fix the bond number to be a third, which means that B equals zero. Our, uh, our constant current is playing in, inside the book fluid. And the topography is modeled by this function, Hx, where it is the sum of two um, uh, located uh, Gaussian bumps. Uh, we fix the positions of each bump to be at X equals minus 100 and X equals 800. So uh, an important thing that we need to have in mind before starting showing the, the simulations is the classification of the flow. So basically the flow is called supercritical, supercritical or nearly resonant depending on whether F is greater than zero, less than zero or approximately zero. Uh, and uh, analogously, the capillary effect is strong, weak or intermediate, uh, whether B is greater than zero, less than zero, or approximately zero. In all simulations that we are about to see, we fix the bond number to be a third, which means B equals zero. And we let F uh, vary, okay? Uh, regarding the, um, the flow classification, I the idea is that um, when F equ equals zero or close to zero, the dynamic is more nonlinear. And uh, when F is much bigger than zero or lesser than zero, the dynamic is more linear, okay? So uh, the results that I'm about to show were published in this article, Grab Capillary Flows Over Obstacles for the Fifth Order for Secret of Activities with um, Roberto Ribeiro. It was published last year in the Journal of Engineering Mathematics. And uh, 
now we are going to look first at uh, the simplest dynamic, it's, uh, which is the non-resonant region. So we will be looking at the supercritical and uh, supercritical case, and then later on we will be look at the nearly resonant region where uh, more complicated dynamic arise. So uh, first, uh, let's fix our f equals zero point two and the two obstacles uh, with the same amplitude. So initially the dynamic that we have here is the formation of an elevation wave above each obstacle. Some radiation is produced during the formation and uh, in the middle of the, the dynamic, this radiation starts to transit from one obstacle to another remaining trapped between the, the two bombs. And uh, as a consequence, this uh, elevation wave that was supposed to reach an steady state uh, never reaches it because the radiation persists for very large times. And then we, when we look at this, this picture, it's very clear that um, the two dynamics are quite independent in the sense that um, even when we look at the dynamic at large times, we can point out where the obstacles are located the interaction between the two obstacles uh, are not uh, that strong. But uh, when we increase uh, the amplitude of one of the obstacles, the dynamic changes drastically. Still at large times, we can point out where the two obstacles are, but now above the large obstacle, the dynamic becomes more nonlinear. We see the formation of a higher amplitude elevation wave above the left obstacle, and this wave train that propagates uh, upstream. On the other hand, the, the dynamic on above the, the smaller obstacle is much simpler. We see this very small uh, elevation wave. Again, it doesn't reach a steady state because some radiation is, is still trapped uh, between the, the two bumps. So uh, now what we do is try to, is to swap the position of the two obstacles. Now um, the left ob obstacle is the largest, but we switch it. And then the dynamic change here. Um, first of all, at early times, again, the dynamic is very independent above each obstacle, but the interaction uh, is quite different. As one can see, uh, when we look at the last panel, for example, the dynamic produced by the larger obstacle is more nonlinear and it somehow swallows um, the dynamic produced by the, the smaller obstacle. So when we look at the dynamic at very large times, um, it's clear that the obstacle that plays an important role um, is the, the one that um, is larger. Okay, so we can say that uh, in this case, the dynamic is controlled by the, the larger obstacle. Uh, now let's look at the supercritical case, uh, which happens when f is less than zero. So again, we start out our discussion considering obstacles with small amplitudes. And um, this, uh, actually they have the same amplitude in this case. And the dynamic we see is the formation of a depression solitary wave above each obstacle. There are some wave train uh, being generated downstream. So at early times, we still see some interaction, but uh, after a while, the dynamic above the, each obstacle is well established. So we see this typical uh, depression solitary waves. So the dynamic, we can say that uh, is quite uh, well behaved here. It's very simple. So what we do now, uh, we increase uh, the amplitude of uh, the right obstacle and the dynamic change uh, quite a bit. Just let's go back here for a second. We see two well-defined depression solitary waves uh, with a small amplitude, but now the, the depression uh, solitary waves very uh, larger amplitude. And uh, the, as the obstacle is larger, we see the generation of this depression solitary waves periodically. So one can actually compute uh, the period of time of which uh, each solitary depression solitary wave is generated. Okay. 
So uh, when we look at uh, what is going on in the neighborhood of the smaller obstacle, we still see a dynamic similar to the one present in the, in the last slide, okay? So let's swap the positions of the two obstacles. The dynamic seem very similar, but now um, we can say that uh, it is being controlled by the, the larger obstacle since uh, uh, this uh, elevation wave is disturbed every time by a depression solitary wave. Okay. So, uh, uh, excuse me, can I ask something? Uh, sure. Uh, so in these examples, there is a current, right? That is, yeah. uh, so it, it is going to the right or to the left? Uh, it's going to, from right to the left, but we uh, are in the from right to... Okay, yeah, please. Yeah. Uh, so right to left, but uh, you are in a reference frame that is moving with the current. Exactly. So meaning that these uh, solitary waves of depression are moving against the current, right? Yes, you're right. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. So uh, next we move to the resonant region, uh, which presents more nonlinear features. So, uh, we start discussing the supercritical case. Although we are in the supercritical case here, uh, we are also in the near resonant because F is close to uh, zero now, okay? So at the early times, we see again, the dynamic very independent above each obstacle, but it, uh, um, on the larbor, it starts to be formed above each obstacle. On the left, uh, we see it more clearly but um, some wave train also propagates uh, downstream from the left obstacle and wave trains propagate upstream from the, the right obstacle. And these waves interact. interact. And uh, what happens uh, is that somehow it doesn't let the ondular board be formed over the, the right obstacle. So when we look at the dynamic at large times, Basically, what we see is only uh, the left obstacle. So somehow it is controlling the, the dynamic at large times because above the right obstacle, we see only uh, small radiation. The, the possible formation of ondular bore was killed at um, early times. Next, we increase uh, the amplitude of the left obstacle and the dynamic here is very well defined. Mm -hmm. We see the formation of this um, higher uh, amplitude um, ondular bore, which propagates uh, upstream. This formation of a wave train also moving upstream, some radiation being propagated downstream. Again, um, the dynamic can be said that being controlled by the, the largest obstacle. And uh, at this point, uh, the dynamic seems, although we have two obstacles, the dynamic seems to be basically controlled by one. So it doesn't seem to, to make sense to study the problem with two obstacles, right? At least when we look at this picture, because, well, if the largest one control, well, we can just consider the one obstacle problem. However, when we switch the position of the two obstacles, the dynamic changes drastically. Uh, we see the initial formation of the ondular bore. And uh, when, well, I cannot point at the picture, but uh, we see that some wave train is being compressed between the two ondular bores and somehow it collapses. And uh, when we look at the, the full uh, model, it uh, can be said that it's an indication of a formation of a dispersive shock. And then, um, a bit later, we see that some depression solitary waves start to moving up the ondular bore. And uh, at very late times, the dynamic is, is very chaotic. One cannot say even where the obstacles are because everything is disordered, okay? And the subcritical case uh, in nearly resonant region, we see again, the formation of depression solitary waves. Uh, between the two obstacles, we see that some waves seem to be transiting from one obstacle to another. Some of them seem to disappear and they, they come back between the two obstacles. 
but um, there is no indication that these waves will be uh, trapped uh, between these two obstacles. Then we increase, and now it's more, uh, it's clear that uh, we see these three uh, waves moving back and forth between the two obstacles. Uh, we run our computations for very large times and uh, it seems these three waves uh, remain um, trapped. Um, just a second. Okay. Uh, so once we have looked at these three uh, depression solitary waves, um, it's interesting to ask if it's possible to generate them from grass without all this disorder dynamic that appears moving downstream. So uh, in a recent work uh, that was published in the Computational and Applied Mathematics, I revisited the problem, but uh, I consider now that uh, the flow speed uh, depends on time. So the equation is pretty much the same as I showed at the beginning of the presentation, but now F depends on time. This parameter epsilon squared is just a, a rescaling of the, um, the high order dispersed return. And then uh, there is some regimens that it's possible to generate this depression wave that uh, seems to be trapped above the obstacles. On the right, uh, we see the, how the, its amplitude varies with the, the speed of the, the flow. And uh, as we can see, there is this indication that the wave amplitude is increasing. So we believe that uh, although our numerical simulation were not able to capture exactly if they this depression wave uh, escapes out or not, um, this change of the amplitude indicates that it, uh, it really might uh, leave uh, the region above the bump. And then, when we, uh, we vary the epsilon parameter, the number of waves that uh, are trapped in the neighborhood of the obstacle change. Okay, so when we increase epsilon, the, the number of the trapped waves uh, diminishes. And then uh, this is a recent work that was published uh, last month, actually, uh, we revisited the, the two obstacle problems, but um, as the at the beginning of the talk, I, I said, uh, when we consider uh, a moving disturbance on the free surface and the obstacle, there are some regions that the dynamic is pretty much the same. So in this article, uh, what Roberto and I did was to consider the full Euler equation and investigate some of the features that uh, we studied for the fifth order forces Kurtevac debris. So uh, here I'd like to show some interesting features that we found. First, uh, on the right, uh, when we have um, a moving disturbance in the supercritical regimen, which means that the full number is greater than one, we see this uh, elevation wave where the pressure, pressure is being applied and then this wave train that moves uh, upstream. So there is no indication that these waves uh, may break, but when we add a very small uh, disturbance uh, in the far field of the, the right disturbance, some resonance seem to occur, and then this wave seems to grow towards a, a value, which indicates the, uh, the formation of a wave break. Our numerical method uh, is spectral, so we are not uh, able to prove anything that uh, uh, regarding wave breaking, but it's a, a strong indication that uh, the presence of a second disturbance uh, may generate a wave breaking phenomenon. And uh, when we look at the, uh, the critical region, here F is exactly one, uh, something very interesting appeared at large times. So we seem to have a very complicated dynamic, but uh, depression solitary waves emerge from, from this chaotic dynamic. It's similar what happens when we look at um, the Strovist equation, uh, when wave packets start being uh, generated at very large times. So this behavior was uh, quite a uh, surprise for us. Uh, so now the, some, just to sum up the, some of the results that we discussed, basically when the surface tension is not neglected 
Uh, the flow is not necessarily governed by the larger obstacle. Trapped waves can be generated from rest and uh, in the full model, we, and we find the indication of uh, just first wave shock formation. Uh, these are some uh, articles that uh, I have published with uh, Roberto in the past two years uh, regarding trapped waves. Um, and uh, basically the last one that was published last, uh, last month uh, was the one that uh, we used the full wider equations as a, a model. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, that's it. Um, now I am available for comments or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor, very much. I don't know. If, is there any question? Let me see the chat. Um, I, I'll ask a question, yes. Um, so th thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I'm wondering, do you think that it's possible to extend this to rotational currents? So, in just in light of the fact that you can uh, you can derive a KDV um, that includes the effects of rotation and currents, do you think that uh, this would be um, is something that's doable using the methods that you've presented? Uh, yes, it is possible actually to derive a rotational KDV from the other equations. We can actually use the same. Um, tools to, to study the, even the full mo model uh, using uh, a non-uniform current. But the problem when we use the order of equation is that we have a limitation, the vorticity needs to be constant. So if we want to let the, the vorticity vary in a more broadly way, then you need to use the, the full order equation, not the potential theory. Um, so the numerical methods that we use cannot be applied. But it would be very interesting to consider the, the full model, uh, inserting um, a current that uh, well, the, the vorticity is not necessarily constant. So I'm thinking of the KDV um, with, um, uh, with current derived by, say, Freeman and Johnson in the, I think, in the early 80s, where you, der you, you get a Burns condition uh, on, on the current into it, and, but otherwise your KDV is, is pretty much um, unaltered. So... Um, yeah, um, I, maybe I have another question if if you don't mind. So it it okay. seemed for for large times, um, you uh, at least in the for downstream of your of the obstacles, it seemed like there was almost a steady state that was reached in terms of what these undular bores were doing. Is there any oh. um, and so uh, okay, not in all of the cases, but in uh, uh, let me, I guess it's, uh, this is the picture, right? For example, yes. I, I wonder if there's any way, um, do you think that this could be captured um, via some just some uh, simple asymptotics for, for long times? Could you capture what the behavior is going to be for that um, downstream steady state? Uh, yes, actually you can. Uh, I guess Greenshaw did it, uh, but uh, only considering a single obstacle. When you add um, another obstacle, it seems the problem will be the same because the function that models the, the obstacle is just one function, right? But when we have the presence of a second obstacle, it uh, brings a lot of problems uh, during the asymptotic analysis because the dynamic is not really independent at uh, large times. But uh, Greenshaw has a, a work for uh, the one obstacle problem, but considering only the third order um, FKDV equation when we have uh, capillary effects, it's, it's harder to deal with the equation because uh, of the, the fifth order derivative term. Because when we do a syntactic analysis and we have to derive uh, a function five times, it uh, brings a lot of problem. Thank you. Uh, you are welcome. I have a question now since you're in this uh, slide here. So VT uh, is, the, is the speed of the flow. And that's ah. what you're going to use to generate the waves, right? Yeah, you're right. So the, the idea is that what, like that, that V of zero, it is zero and then increase it or, I mean, it starts from zero to a certain value. How is this function V or it keeps ah. uh, changing all over the place or? Okay, in, in this particular simulation that uh, it's displayed in this, in this slide, VT is a linear function, but, um, 
uh, you can use like but the but, uh, but it's not that it grows uh, uh, indefinitely. So it grows from zero to a certain value, and then it stays at that value. Uh, right? it's uh, what. Well, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a limited. Lim it's just a part of a linear function. What we do, we let it grows very uh, slowly. Mm -hmm. So, just to give you an example, would be something like v t equals zero point zero 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 one times t. Okay, and uh, you leave it on for a certain amount of time, and then you just leave it a uh, constant. It's not that it is going to keep increasing eventually. It yes. reaches a value. Okay. It's, you, you're right. It's because the critical value happens when V equals zero. So what we do to, to generate this type of wave is that we want the VT to cross change sign, basically, but very uh, slowly. So we can transit from the super, supercritical region to the supercritical region. And to do that, it, the transition has to be very slow because uh, if you just make the transition quicker, then waves are not trapped. They just move away from the obstacle. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, you are welcome. Okay. I don't see any other question here. So let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.